What is up, everybody? This is Josh coming to you with another episode of the Affiliate Marketing Show. Please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date on all the latest affiliate marketing news, tips, and trends. Again, Josh from OfferVault.com, the industry's largest aggregator of all things affiliate marketing. If you're looking for networks, offers, affiliate programs, anything related to your affiliate marketing success, make sure you check out OfferVault.com. Once again, our good friends over at Pinup Partners are doing us, sending us so much love by sponsoring this show again. We love Pinup Partners, and uh, if you're an iGaming enthusiast, boy, do I have some news for you, all right? This is something you don't want to miss. Our friends at Pinup Partners are turning eight years old, and to celebrate this incredible milestone, they're launching one of the most epic promotions the iGaming market has ever seen. That's right, with over 500 prizes, hundreds of challenges, and a prize pool worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, this contest is going to be massive, huge. Whether you're a seasoned affiliate or just getting started, there's something for everyone. The promotion kicks off now and runs all the way until December, broken down into three exciting stages. All right, listen carefully here. Affiliates and partners can dive into daily challenges, score instant rewards, and of course, enter into the grand prize drawings. Oh, what's the grand prize, you ask? Well, I'm glad you did. When we say grand, we mean it. We're talking a luxury car and an exclusive party in the Alps. Want in on the action? It's super simple. Just sign up with their bot by clicking the link in the description and make sure you follow the competition guidelines to start racking up those entries. Don't miss out on this epic celebration. Pin up partners, eight years in the industry, and you could be the one walking away with some serious prizes. Good luck out there and may the odds be in your favor. Outside of myself and per usual, we have Mr. Paper Call, Adam Young, as well as the Jet Poppy, Harrison Gewurz, plus our special, special guest today, Rohit Ajmani, CEO of Idea Clan, a company that works with global brands to deliver data-driven lead gen, customer acquisition, and brand awareness campaigns through various digital spaces. I'm out of breath. Uh, Adam, did you know that Harrison is selling jets to the entire industry and celebrities? What's going on with this? Yeah. I was doing some math on the number of jets that Harrison was selling, and I did a data visualization of how many tanker trucks it actually takes to... I'm an environmentalist, everyone. I hope you're happy. (laughs) And I was kind of surprised at how much jet fuel Harrison is actually selling. It's pretty impressive. But what he's doing is really cool. He... um, He has been doing bookings for a ton of Ringba customers, industry folks, um, and surprisingly, a whole bunch of celebrities. And what's really cool about what he does for our customers and the industry folks is he gives them incredibly good deals um, because it's a a super cool thing and it's a passion project for him. So uh, so I've seen him give people deals that are pretty unbelievable. So if you need a private jet, small, big, Boeing business jet, whatever you need. You got to hit up the jet poppy because he'll take care of you. I will say this. Flying private is like smoking crack, but less bad for you. It's just bad for the environment, but it is. Yeah, Josh, there's really only two kinds of people in this world. Those who fly private and those who would if they could. No. I agree. Unfortunately, I fall into the latter category. Adam, I'm going to come right back to you. I see you're in a new location. I want to ask you about that real quick. Rohit, what's up, dude? Thanks for joining the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm good. We got a lot to talk to you about. Real quick, Adam, you look like you're in a log cabin of sorts. Where where are you coming to us from? Uh, I'm actually in La Jolla in a place called the Lotus House. Here, I'll, I'll show you. It's it's pretty wild. It's this uh, it's this famous house that was built by a wild architect, and it's made of just wood and concrete. And the the ceilings are all wavy, and it it's shaped like a flower. And you walk down the stem as you go lower into the house. It's it's pretty incredible. I'm working on the Contact.io keynote, uh, which is about entrepreneurial resilience and building a business and what it takes to really do that. And 
I decided that I wanted to come to a really amazing creative environment to work on that um, because I think you get a much better outcome based on the environment you're in when you're doing certain types of work. As a musician, I'm sure you can appreciate this. I also, uh, we haven't talked about it, but I also am wrapping up uh, the content for my second book. And so I'm out here working on those two things and I'm super excited for the keynote. I have no doubt that anyone that comes to that presentation will walk out of the room a different person. I'm gonna be diving deep into a lot of the challenges and struggles I have faced as an entrepreneur and um, the tools that I used to overcome those challenges. And so I'm really excited about presenting that to an audience. I haven't done that before. A lot of it is based on a personal development program that I've been working on for um, for the, the Mastermind House and uh, some events we have coming up in the future. So it's going to be a, a pretty amazing thing. Um, Seen some previews, bring Kleenexes. Oh, it is literally a presentation on my pain and suffering. So if if you want to watch Adam suffer in front of hundreds of people, I encourage you to come to this keynote. <laughs> yeah, I know you talk about the hero journey a lot. And uh, speaking of the hero journey, Rohit, you got quite the journey, man. I was uh, looking at your website. You got a great like our story page. And it, it really just kind of captivated me. We usually don't talk about origin stories on the show, but I find yours to be really interesting. Um, I know you started off as an engineering student and then you kind of made the transition to full-time entrepreneur. Can you kind of briefly just walk us through what kind of, you know, jumping into the deep end at that point in your life was like? What were some of the bumps along the way and some of the biggest things you learned that kind of helped lead to your success today? Sure. So before I begin, I just got the paper, paper Call Revolution book from Adam a couple of weeks back at my place. I've started reading it. It's really amazing, Adam. Just wanted to say that. And speaking about the journey, so uh, we were, like me and my partner, Sahil, we just began this company called Idea Clan. But before it was the company, we both were engineering students, like you just mentioned. And we had this issue in during our college time that, you know, we didn't have anywhere to look forward to if we had exams and we didn't know how, you know, the exams were in the previous batches, right? See, if we had to refer to the exams from the previous batches, there was no place where, you know, you could go and find them on the internet, for instance. So we started getting these uh, exam papers from our seniors and started putting them on a website uh, just to help our friends out and started as a small project. And then we just put, a bunch of Google AdSense ads on, on the website. It, got a, it started getting a lot of traffic traction and we realized, oh, we can make a lot of money through this. And from there, the journey began. And, uh, uh, you know, we had a six-month college uh, internship sort of program where we thought one website can make us like $300, $400 a month, which was a big deal. This is back in 2008, we're talking for us. And then how about we make 100 websites? We just multiplied like $500 a month that we were making at that time into 100, so $50,000. So we had great dreams that we'll make $50,000 a month. And this is like, you know, 19, 20 year old boys in college making those dreams. So we went out, we made uh, 100 websites and we posted a lot of content from, you know, we bought a lot of books which were not on the internet, rewrote all that content and then came as soon as we finished with all those 100 websites, uh, then came the Panda and Penguin updates of Google back then, the SEO updates. And they screwed all the website we had. We, had, we got zero traffic and all that money and time we had spent, it went to trash. And whatever we had made from the first website we had, which was called Newton007, had also gone away. And then we had to find some other way to you know innovate and start making money because we were already in that game. So in this was 2011, we started looking, there were a lot of viral apps that used to go viral on Facebook back then, like, you know, what will your girlfriend look like? Or what will your baby look like? Or whatever, right? So crazy viral apps. And we started building these apps. And one night, you know, I just posted uh, one of these websites that we had built on my own Facebook page. 
it went viral overnight and we made like 500 bucks in the night and i was like holy shit this thing is insane and then from there we started building a lot of apps this was back in 2011 early 2012 uh, there were days where we made 25000 dollars a day continuously for a few days which was really amazing and in our in, in our college i remember the teacher stopped asking question about electrical or electronic engineering that we were in and they were more more like asking like oh you both are coming in two cars or one car i mean, I mean the whole college was really proud of us and what we had built and what we were doing from there you know uh, you know facebook apps facebook then after that gradually reduced the reach of uh, organic posting and stuff so we had to navigate to paid marketing uh, and then we started moving into facebook ads and then gradually coming to all these shows in the us um, going to the affiliate west affiliate summit east affiliate world learning all that stuff and then moved on to lead gen paper call ecom content search arbitrage and that's how the journey was so rohit part. i'm sure there's a lot of students watching this episode right now what's up students how you doing um what would be like you know they're probably wondering <laughs> what would uh what would you say to them like how did you figure it out you know i know that's like such an open-ended question but like where did you go to learn how to do all this stuff to build and get started in this industry were you just kind of searching the internet for help videos were you talking to industry experts i know you were going to trade shows, but that was a little bit later. So at the very beginning, like what was your biggest tool or resource that someone watching this episode might be able to do today to kind of get them over that initial hurdle? Right. So I was in a couple of clubs in my college, uh, which had some seniors who were doing some funky stuff on the internet. Like they were building those back then, you know, there were some apps, softwares that used to make for, you know, stuff like, uh, picking online, you know, questionnaire and stuff like that. So we had some seniors who were making money through AdSense. And I had, I was lucky enough to join these clubs. Like I, there was an IEEE club, there was an IT club. So I was in these clubs all, and I was always interested to do something beyond what the regular curriculum was teaching, which I always thought was outdated and I had no interest whatsoever. If you were to ask me anything about electronic engineering right now, I don't know how those chips and all that stuff is made. My my interest was always to, you know, into I have a mind in 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 you know all this online uh, money making stuff from the very go, right? So I went to these seniors of mine, uh there's a very funny story, you know, when we were building this first website of ours called Newton 007, we didn't even know how to code. And we spent like two whole days making that index page and it was not loading. And we had no idea why it was not. We learned everything from, you know, W3 schools and all these websites, but the website was not loading. Then I literally called my senior. I asked him, please look at what, what's not working. And you know, the mistake that was there, we had just written index.html in capital letters. So the website wouldn't load the index page on by default. So I mean, from there to the whole journey, now we have like a almost 250 people team, 50 people just in the tech team. So that journey has been amazing. And for any new people, I would just say, you know, be in, in like, you know, Adam just said, he went out in an environment where his brain helps him focus on stuff, right? I also like that kind of stuff. So I was in an environment with my seniors who were into all this stuff, who were into the money-making game, technology. So that really helped us get into all of this. Yeah, going back to Idea Clan, now managing over 200 people, I believe. Um, you know, it's crazy when you talk about going from just you and your friend having this idea to now working and managing 200 people at the company. How have, how has your leadership skills kind of developed over time as your company has grown? And when it comes to leadership in general, what are some of the things that you feel work very well? And on the contrary, some things that you have found through experience do not. Right, right. I mean, this leadership journey is something we've been exploring since the last couple of years a lot. We've also joined a management consulting firm just to understand how to take 
company from where we are right now to even 10x so this leadership thing is something like we believe that there is a future which is the command center you know in in previous days like if you go back like 500 600 years 1000 years it was all the army driven thing right so there was a command center and they used to literally command all the people do this do that but that's that does not exist now in businesses right so i believe the future is our command center which we co create with the team so we go out we co create a future which we already did a couple of years back a future for like the next 5 years and that was a co created vision with all the leadership and now that future inside of that future all the actions that we are taking today it's that future that's driving all those actions for us then uh when when we started building all those actions and things in it we learned that there were a lot of breakdowns that come on the way right? a lot of challenges a lot of things not falling into place so what we figured out that until and unless we put ourselves at the source of everything so if something is not performing in my team my tl is not performing my manager is not working my media guy is not working i don't have to blame like he's not doing something or she's not doing something if 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 the problem is with somebody else then you know i can't do anything about it right but if i am at the source what did so our thinking is like around what did i not do so that my media guy didn't do x didn't for, follow the sop or didn't you know create run the campaigns effectively whatever so we think like that like what should we do to make sure that you know my leadership goes in a certain direction and right now at this stage in the company what we are doing is with i also read a book recently called the ceo within and i'm trying to you know make the leadership of my company like ceos of whatever they are leading because we do lead gen we do paper call e-commerce content hub search hub so we do a lot of things and right now i'm building leadership in a way that they they are the ceo of that business and they are running the show and earlier it was i who was like i i never believed that you know this guy could do um you know he could come up with crazy ideas it was i always who had to provide the ideas and they had to execute and now i'm developing them in a way that you know they are the ceo of the business and i'm developing their thinking so if they come up with a question i ask them you tell me what should be the you know solution for this and then you ask another question like what does not work right so in our company we believe there are four pillars of you know leadership which are like integrity existence existence as in putting things in calendar we use click up so putting everything into existence then enrollment and relationship so we believe these four pillars are most critical so if there is any issue in between the teams like creative team and media bank team or business development team there are issues right until and unless these four pillars are you know functioning if, the, if there's a relationship issue until and unless that relationship is not good we won't go on to act solving the real issue so that's how you know we operate in our company and if these four pillars don't work then you know it's something that you know it doesn't work for us plus uh, off li- another thing that we have learned is that you know we have to work with a listers majorly so if somebody is a c or a d performer uh, we'll just put him on a pip and you know we'll make sure that you know we don't keep we only work with a listers because a listers like to work with a list people and you know together they create the best version of the idea that we have so that's that's how what we do at for leadership you know, you know who also only works with a listers ringba and i know this wasn't on the uh, itinerary but i do see the go award behind you can you just tell us a little bit about um how you got it what the campaign was or you know the the specifics that kind of led to that award sitting right behind you today josh sure, wants so- all your keywords all your at and no, i'm just kidding um, <laughs> <laughs> So we've always been a lead gen focused company since the last four or five years, but uh, last year, like we saw lead gen really evolve and a lot of people moving towards paper call, especially with the new government guidelines and things coming up. And um, you know, so we also thought it's the right time. Until two thousand twenty two, what we were doing is we were doing paper call, but it was through lead gen. Like we just used to put phone numbers on our landing pages. 
and you know most of the people used to go on the leads and funnel but somebody wanted to call they could call and then we we said now when we started seeing a lot of success we started hearing a lot about aca medicare calls go through the roof that is when we decided let's build a team just around paper call and this go to word it majorly came last year from running those aca and medicare calls call campaigns uh, that we were scaling awesome. you know josh i want to I want to comment on something Rohit said there because it's super, super important to running a really successful business. And that's making sure that you're working with incredible people, but more importantly, what to do when someone doesn't meet those standards or culture. And I think it's something that a lot of leaders don't love to talk about publicly because firing people is never a fun thing. It, really truly isn't and i don't enjoy doing it um i don't think anyone really does it's not fun but it's something that's super important because if you have someone that's on your team that's not thriving not only are you penalizing that person by keeping them on your team you're penalizing everybody else that they work with exactly. because if they're not thriving they need to go somewhere where they can right like i think i think intrinsically Almost every human is good and wants to do a good job, but a lot of the times they're just not in a role where they can do that. And so you're really doing everyone a favor by giving them an opportunity to go find a better fit for them. And then as leaders, you know, something that we're changing now is our engineering teams have a bonus structure and we used to do reviews they take a lot of time and then we look at the performance of the company and the individual and then you know there's this bonus structure in place and we recently decided that we don't need to do the reviews because great people do great work and we don't need to go through the theater of sitting down really amazing people and saying like hey we reviewed your work it's really good like obviously it's really good um, no, they wouldn't be uh, here. Yeah, exactly. And so we were just like, wait a second, why are we doing this? Like, this isn't productive. And then we're changing the bonus structure. The team will effectively get the same amount of, of money, but you either qualify for the bonus or you don't. And if you don't, you don't work at Ringba anymore because we're not really interested in people that do the absolute bare minimum just above the line of acceptability. Like those aren't the type of people that I want to work with and neither Harrison either. And we're not like slave drivers here. We're, we're, we don't expect people to work 16 hours a day, seven days a week or, no, or we anything don't. like that. We want yeah. people to have like work-life balance so that they can be productive and efficient and effective at what they do. And I'll just, this, this is like six, seven, maybe eight plus years ago. Um, I, I was just thinking about this cause I saw like the, one of our Amexes at him. It says since 2013, I was like, fuck, we've been working together a long time. I didn't even realize we were uh, a long time. And, and, uh, you know, this is like not, not room another business we had and we were going to fire someone. And I was like, we don't want to do this. Da, 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 da. And like, you kind of, you laid it out like this and you kind of just said it, but it was essentially like, if you can look at firing someone in this perspective, which is that. By keeping the person that is not performing to the standards of the organization that the business needs to, you know, that it are expected of them for the business to run efficiently, it's not fair to all the other team members. So that, like, yeah, it sucks. I got to fire, you know, whoever here, John Smith, but like, there's a bigger picture than just John Smith and John Smith is bringing down other people. And also it makes the guy that's busting ass, the gal that's busting ass, you know, really working hard and going the extra mile. It, it, it discredits their work. And so if you can kind of wrap your head around that and go, Oh, like there's actually like a value to keeping, you know, keeping the quality high and getting rid of those people that shouldn't be there. Uh, it, it makes the whole perspective and kind of anxiety regarding firing someone a bit easier to work with because you can kind of see it in a different perspective. Yeah. You're defending all the people that deserve to be there. 
And running a high performance organization is a really hard thing because you have to make sure that you're hiring people that are great at what they do, hopefully better, uh, better than you at, at it. And, you know, I think that's been one of the keys to our success, Harrison, at Ringbos. We've always looked for the highest quality people possible. Even when the business wasn't making any money, we brought on people whose salaries were just like crazy to us at the time. We had never hired people like that before. We thought it was insane how much money that we were paying some of these people, but they were brilliant at what they did. And they delivered so much value that years later, it was probably one of the best returns on investment you and I have ever made. And now we think about it entirely differently. Like, Change our perspective you know, entirely on how to invest <laughs> in talent. We're not, we're not looking, you know, we don't go to Sam's club for staffing anymore. No, you really have to hire the best talent you can possibly afford and then give them what they want or more. And that's interesting. You know, it's interesting. We're talking about this. I received a LinkedIn message yesterday about my book and um, this other author is writing a book and they really loved some things that we did. And you know, twofold. Uh, they they asked me to get on a call, um, and then also asked like, "Hey, I, I want to learn how you did what you did." And my response actually was, you know, "Hey, I can't do the call because of my schedule, but find someone who's incredibly good at what you need them to do, hire them, and pay them more money than what they ask for." And that was my my reply to this person. Um, because that's really what you need to do. Like if, if someone, if you know, someone can change the outcome of your business, cause they're so good at what they do, they can move mountains. Like it doesn't matter what you give that person. They're going to get you the return. You need to make sure that it's the right person, but you know, like I would rather not eat food and hire someone that is incredible and just give them all the money than to hire someone mediocre because um, you end up spending so much more time and energy uh, dealing with that. And then um, Rohit, on, on something you said, this happens to me all the time. People reach out to me and ask me to take phone calls on a daily basis. Uh, I think I get like a hundred emails a week at this point, all sorts, right? Like paper call related, venture capitalists, private equity, uh, people who just want advice. like oh, it's Adam, People might be eating with all the VC and, you know, private equity. <laughs> I hope you have an air sickness bag. My reply to the VC people is funny. I just reply unsub and they always freak out. They're like, what? This human doesn't want our money. I'm like, no, I don't want to talk to you. But, um, you know, when you said people were reaching out to you and you reached out to people, uh, and you were trying to get into these college groups so that you could learn. Um, what doesn't happen very often to me anyways, is when people reach out, they don't try and offer me something of value in exchange for that time. They don't say, hey, Adam, you know, I think this would be really valuable to you. You know, can we can we talk 20 minutes, try and give me something and then. Uh, maybe ask me the question they, they want to ask me in return. Instead, it's always like, hey, you know, can let's get 20 minutes on the calendar. And I'm 20 minutes on the calendar. Like, dude, there's just like no, dude, no I way. I can't, I can't stand those emails. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in hell, ask Josh. Josh literally runs <laughs> Offer Vault for Harrison and I. And he will ask me for 30 seconds and I'll ignore him <laughs> for days. And so like 20 minutes just is, ne is never happening. And so I just think like it's so easy to offer someone something of value in exchange for their time so that they can get they can accelerate your progress. And we do this all the time. We'll reach out to experts on LinkedIn or people we want to talk to. And I don't even mess around. I just reach out to someone and be like, hi, I'd like to talk to you for an hour. I'll send you fifteen hundred dollars in advance. Can we chat for an hour? And then I am getting a, a reply immediately. We send them the 1500 or 500 or, or whatever based on what they do. Uh, but whatever it is, it's like an offer that they can't turn down. And We've blown some minds with that strategy. <laughs> yeah. 
And we get people on the phone and that hour turns into three hours and then they end up sending us all sorts of great follow up material and you have a friend for life and like the money you spend is is trivial based on the, the knowledge you get. And so I encourage people to think about when you reach out to ask someone for their time, how to compensate them or offer something of value because you'll get a reply and, you know, that that can really change the game. And if you're a student like Rohit was and you're trying to get into a, a group or learn from the marketers or whatever, you know, do some research, find a campaign, reach out to them and say, hey, guys, I see this campaign. I think people are making a ton of money with it. I'd love to come to your meeting and bring information about this campaign. Maybe we can reverse engineer it together and learn from it. Like, like you know, show up with something of value and people will take you a lot more seriously and, and respect you. And it can it can really open a, a lot of doors. I, I just I hate to ever assume that if I reach out to somebody that I'm owed their time and I always try and serve them and over deliver first. And and I think that has just been something that's been really powerful in my career. What's an approach, Adam, follow-up question for someone that doesn't have $1,500 for an hour? Or if you're reaching well, out to somebody- let me just jump in. Wait, wait. I if mean, you're reaching out to somebody where money is like not an object to them and they don't need $1,500, you know what I mean? How would you handle it that way, Harrison? Well, when I was young, I reached out to people all the time for shit they shouldn't have helped me with. And I think this, it goes down to, you know, simple principles of life, like, you know- the word you should always ask because the worst thing that someone's going to say is no. Um, mm -hmm. And if, if, you know, you send an email or a LinkedIn message or whatever it is to someone and you want to, you want to pick their brain or they're an expert or well-known in a certain field that you're learning about, or, you know, jumping into the world of typically, you know, 98% of people are really cool and happy to help and talk to you or point you in the right direction. Um, I've talked about this with trade show strategy, like, you know, first trade show, go talk, introduce yourself and work with everyone and anyone you can, you know, the internet's a pretty global place. I've reached out to people that I had no business talking to or working with and just asked for shit or asked for favors or had knowledge, advice, feedback, guidance, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, we're all humans. So surprisingly, most people are pretty cool about it. Adam and I have definitely been told to piss off a few times too. Um, <laughs> Hundreds. <laughs> we we remember that. But the thing is, like the guy who uh, does a favor for me and walks me through something simple or not so simple, like maybe he remembers that I'm an expert in something else, like burning jet fuel or whatever. And then he calls me and asks me, you know, like being collaborative helps. So like you just got to try. I know that there's no like crazy recipe for that, but like it literally is how it works. Like you just like, hey, man. I'm really interested in this. You're the guy. This reminds me of a. This reminds works. me of a quote. A quote that I made up recently. It's uh, you miss a hundred percent of the that. shots. You miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. I made that up. I mean, I'm this is a bad sure example. Jordan. But the guy from War Dogs. <laughs> the guy from War Dogs came on the podcast. The reason is because I sent him an Instagram message, and I was like, "Yo, dude, we're in this this penthouse. You want to come come do the pod?" And he was like. Yeah, can I get some of the raw video files? We we're like, yeah, dude, let's one of, ride. One of the very few people that did it in person as well, David Packhouse. Yeah. Shout he out, had no friend problem. of the And you know, I think we he really should be thanking us because after us, he's done like Nike. He, he was on Fox News. He's done a bunch of huge. He was on like primetime <laughs> seven p.m. show. Like we deserve royalties, honestly, David. If you're watching this, <laughs> call us. We'll, we'll work something out. We still we got you. You know. Well, Josh, I think I think to your point there, Harrison always played to his strengths. And sometimes that strength is like just talking about who you are and why. And when he was really young, like 13, 14, 15, 16, I know you'd reach out to people and be like, hey, I'm I'm a 14 year old marketer and I'm trying to do this. Like he made the backstory appealing and made it somewhat made himself someone that people wanted to help um and also he's right we've done this all the time we were never scared of rejection and so you know i said hundreds of times we've probably been told no 
thousands of times over the years. And that's why I advocate storytelling or trying to give something a, a value. Because you tell a great story and connect with the human that works, or you try and give something a value, you know, that that can work as well. Um, and, you know, I think Harrison and I have like literally built our careers off of this. We just hit up random people on the internet. We've built businesses that way. We've met people all over the world that way. We've, We've hung out with people in other countries because I sent a LinkedIn and I'm like, dude, we do this, this, and you do that. And it's cool. And we should hang out. You like sushi? Yeah. I mean, think about club, Adam. We have a friend I know. who's like extremely smart individual. His family is extremely powerful in Thailand. And we met him on an airplane. Like I met him in business class on Thai airlines and we've hung out. I've hung out with him in multiple countries. Like we, we just lost. Oh, here he's bro. He's back. Okay. Uh, you know, it's just like I was shooting the shit with a guy on an airplane and he became a good friend of ours. And like, and he asked for something that was extremely complicated for him to get once he couldn't get it. He happened to be in the United States. Um, I'm not going to dive into the details, but <laughs> it was a major problem for him. And so he pinged Harrison. Harrison couldn't help. Harrison pings me. I'm able to help. I ask for nothing in return. Never, never have. Right. And I just handled it for him. And I, I think when you have people in your life and you can help them and find a way again to deliver them value, it can be really beneficial. And I don't expect anything back from Plub. He was just great. He's so nice to us uh when we were in thailand and he's just a really cool guy um and so we do that a lot for people and um it can be a, a really really powerful thing you never know um how someone will react to it and there's so many opportunities for this i was literally at dinner the other night um here a cajun crab boil with my my girlfriend Ooh, that's and we're right sitting up my there. alley dude i love oh crab. yeah it's just it was just uh i don't know like in the bag like one. they put it in yeah, a bag in the yeah bag, dude, dude. Oh. With the bib the whole dude, thing yes. embarrassing to talk about it. but this guy comes in with a co-worker and sits in a booth next to us it's his birthday and he facetimes his best friend and his best friend is not coming to dinner or hanging out with him. And he's like, bro, I told you it's my birthday. You were supposed to come. And the guy's like, well, you know, like I didn't, you know, I, I just wasn't able to make it. He's kind of a horrible best friend. Um, and so this guy was just like really sad on his birthday and down and out. And he was talking to his coworker. Uh, we're talking like minimum wage, right? And so this King Crab Leg, he's going to buy for himself on his birthday is like, a really big deal. Um, it was $67 a pound. And so that's probably, you know, the meal's going to be an entire day's worth of work for this guy. Um, and he's like sad. And so he got up to go outside for a second with his coworker and I paid for the bill. And I told the waiter, do not tell him that I did this until I have left. Um, because I'm not looking for recognition. I'm not, I'm not looking for the attention. I just saw an opportunity where someone wasn't, just wasn't in a good place. And it was trivial for me to do that. So I, I just did it and then left. And, you know, I think if you view life through that lens and you view business through that lens, like how can you help people? How can you serve others? It really changes the outcomes that that happen and it, it really changes what what comes back to you as well. And so I know we went on a tangent here, but, you know, running businesses is less about what you do and a, a lot more about how you do it and with who. Right. Yeah. Well, how you do it, especially in today's day and age, I think has a lot to do with uh the human aspect as well as the technical technological aspect. This is something I want to throw to Rohit here. Um, I know you're pretty passionate about incorporating technology when it comes to your marketing efforts, as well as automating processes and different um, applications that relate to the success of your company and your clients. So 
How do you, in a few different ways, capitalize on technology, where it is now, and how it ties into marketing automation strategies? Sure. So taking off from where Adam left, I just wanted to add that, you know, a lot of our business where we are, a lot of different lines of businesses that we've added, like a recent line of business that we, the latest line of business is search arbitrage. And it does as well as lead chain or paper call for us. So it's really huge for us. And you know how it started? It started through collaboration. So I provided value to a friend who was the industry leader in search arbitrage. I you know, taught him lead gen and then he got us into search arbitrage. So I've, I've always been a believer of sharing knowledge and, you know, you serve the person for share all what you can. And then, you know, the it, it, it's all about karma, the, you know, some value will come back to you. So I always believe in that as well. Okay. Talking about technology front. So we've built a platform uh, because we have almost a hundred media buyers at this point. So there's a, pla- uh, a marketing automation platform called Lookfinity that we've built that we use internally, which is connected to all the different uh, advertising platforms, Facebook, Google, TikTok, native platforms. So for our media buyers, it becomes really easy to just log in into Lookfinity and upload the creatives and automatically launch it across different platforms through just one single login of our platform. So the launching becomes easy. And then we've built a set of rules to optimize, scale, kill the campaigns which are not performing. And then on the creative side, we have a creative analysis process and then we have a creative building process. We've we've started incorporating a lot of AI into uh, our automation, our you know media buying. The goal uh, of ours is to, to reduce the total number of media buyers that we have, just limit. I mean, we, do, we want to remove the media buying thing automatically. We can make, make it the AI marketer. And, you know, just make people the creative guys on the job. So it's all, because it's all about the ad copy at the end of the day right now. We don't want people just pushing the budgets, lowering budgets, doing clones and all that shit. That's what we want the AI to take over. So that's our goal. And that's what we are heading towards gradually. So at this point, we're not hiring new media buyers at all. Whatever issue or scaling thing comes up, the first approach is to solve it using technology, right? So, you know, and we've connected everything into with, with the LLMs like chat, GPT and stuff like that. So, you know, our media buyers just all the data is connected to, you know, GPT and they can simply go into their dashboard and they can ask, oh, show me the heat map of conversions in the last seven days or what percentage of video versus what percentage of image creators are working. And they'll get beautiful insights in the dashboard itself. So we build this amazing panel and we're using tech. I mean, the way we want to lead the industry is through tech and we want to be the pioneers of that and these products that i'm just talking right like, so far we've just been using internally but we're building them for the market as well and we'll be launching them by the end of the year for ad creation and media buying automation that's the thing staying on the uh, technology front here and we'll just touch on it briefly because we do talk about AI quite a bit. I don't mean to beat it into a dead horse for all of our viewers out there, but when it comes to AI-based creatives, do you feel that they are good enough or where they need to be for people to just solely rely on those moving forward? Or is there still like a very big human element that comes into play when, when making creatives for different types of ad campaigns? So there are two types of creators, right? One are the image creators and one are the video creators. I think for image creators right now, the technology has advanced so much that it can do wonderful image creators. And for certain categories, like I was just looking before this call, like home services and Medicare, the entire creatives that are running and scaling right now are AI created. But, you know, it's not as simple as it sounds. So what we have done is we've, you know, fine-tuned the AI models that exist right now, train them with over thousands of images that have worked with us in the past, because you know AI would by default work on you know creating branded sort of images that do not work in the performance industry on a lot of times, right? But we've trained it the way we want it to be trained. We've fine tuned 
the custom GPT that we built, fed it with the kind of creatives that work for us. And then we also are able to, you know, hack uh, into a lot of creatives that are already working. So what we do is we just pull those creatives, ask chat GPT or mid journey to describe it like it were a photographer or like, you know, describe it in intricate details and then it describes it. And then we go to like mid journey or a lot of other image creation tools and they produce fabulous results uh, right now. But that training part of uh, the GPT or sorry, training part of any LLM that you do is crucial to, you know, getting the right kind of creators without training. Uh, it becomes a little difficult. And speaking about the uh, creative part on the video side, uh, it, we are not able to produce the and solely rely on like the creatives that are produced because it it's it does not look as real as you know an actual UGC would look that's actually shot. So we just use bits and pieces of it sometimes in our creatives. But what we use the AI for today actually with video creatives is that we believe video creatives have three aspects. One is the actual script. The other part is the frames, like what you show in each scene of the video. We use a lot of B-rolls and stuff, right? Okay. So the visuals, then script, and then the parameters you get on the platform, like media buying parameters, the hook rate, the hold rate, you know, the drop point and all that stuff. So we use, we take all these, uh, you know, different parameters, like, you know, the different parameters that we get on Facebook or TikTok, and we put, upload them into the custom GPT that we've built. And it is able to analyze, you know, it is able to compare like 50 different videos for say Windows remodeling. Uh -huh. And then it's able to tell, you know, which videos hook is best, which videos hold rate is good and what combination should we make and what changes should we make to improve the CTR. So that is what we use the AI technology right now for. We, we've also done one interesting thing. We've fed the AI with like say, over a hundred plus uh, scripts and the frameworks that have worked for us. And then it, we use it to make new scripts that sh that will work based on those hundred that we've taught the algorithm that works. So these are the things that we do for, you know, the creative part using AI. You've mentioned lead gen and paper call a few times on the episode today. Um, I kind of want to play off of that a bit here. The, the next question is more related to like scaling campaigns that fall into those two, you know, categories specifically. What's your approach when it comes to you see something's working really well, but you want to pour some gasoline on the fire. How do you kind of make that happen? So with lead gen, you know, there are a lot of different ways you can do for scaling. Like, you know, you can replicate the same ad into multiple accounts. You can do clones. You can create variations. But uh, the technique that worked for us the most is a, you know, replicating that across different platforms. Something that's working on Facebook, we'll also test it on YouTube Deals. We'll also test it on TikTok. And we also, uh, you know, do some other platforms like TikTok, or like Twitter and Pinterest as well. They, it's not at a massive scale, but it does well. So A, replicating the same thing into different platforms. It might sometimes work on the other platforms, sometimes it may not. But that's always, uh, you know, an interesting Thing to try out. Um, other than that, you know, for scaling, we especially for uh, you know on the ACS side, um, we use a strategy called Halo method, wherein you know we go to Reddit, we go to Quora, we go to different places, we research what's actually what actually people are talking about. For instance, in debt, right now, whatever people are talking about or Medicare, like there was an interesting thing I saw about Medicare last month that worked really well for us is that nursing care at home in Medicare. I mean, people wanted that and they were talking about that on a Reddit, on a subreddit forum. And we tested that. We just test the messaging that's working. And then if that messaging on a link clicks gets a lot of clicks in $5, we know that this message is going to work. And we create a lot of creators around that. UGCs, B-rolls. We test a lot of creators. And then, you know, we just repeat Rinse and repeat the process until we find creators with a good ROI. 
And that's the entire scaling process for us. I just got one more question for you before we let you get out of here. Um, a few episodes ago, we really focused on native advertising as well as paid social. I know those are two things you guys focus on at Idea Clan, as well as page search and display. You know, from those four specifically, um, what do you think is performing the best right now? And based on your answer, like why, why do you think that is? So for us, uh, we've always, you know, we started with Facebook uh, back in 2014. It's always been our first love. Back then when there used to be one cent clicks and 10,000% ROIs. So we started off on those days and, you know, we've always loved Facebook. It, you know, it's always had its ups and downs. But for us, Facebook today even is our number one traffic source when it comes to scaling for lead chain or paper call. But I would like to, you know, say here that, you know, when we talk about just lead gen and paper call, I would say paid social and YouTube. When it comes to search arbitrage, we scale a shit ton on display. I mean, if you go to our page right now on Google Transparency, you will find like 10,000 ads running for that. And then native is another good source for, you know, search arbitrage. In fact, I was talking to Tabula earlier uh, in New York, uh, the meetup that was there, they said 50% of almost all the native spend is on search arbitrage. So, I mean, native is really cool for search arb. And then paid search, I would say is majorly, you know, we do it for a little bit of e-commerce stuff and, you know, just where the quality of the camp is going a little down. So we just put in some paid search to, you know, get the quality up. So just to mix the quality from the social. So that's, my take on the you know, traffic source side. Well, Rohit, that's a wrap. You did it, man. Thanks for coming on the Affiliate Marketing Show. We appreciate it. For myself, Josh from Offer Vault, Mr. Paper Call, Adam Young, as well as the Jet Poppy, Harrison Gewurz, and our special guest, Rohit Ajmani, CEO of Idea Clan. Let's make that paper. Let's make that dough. This was the Affiliate Marketing Show. We will see you next time.